morning. My name is Doug, and I get the incredible, huge privilege, honor to be one of the pastors here at Good News, and we are excited to bring you part four of our series, and the final part on hard feelings, and as it was alluded to earlier when Lance announced that it is the emotion of sadness. It's a little bit of a heavy topic of sadness. However, it's a real part of life, and so we don't shun away from it, and the Bible talks about it, so we want to do the same thing. Sadness is that emotion that never entirely leaves the room. It's always with us. It might be hidden. It might, be, it might not be the main focus at the point, at time, but it is there in the room, and it never escapes from being with us. It's kind of ironic that this is the emotion that God would have us look at here today, just days following Thanksgiving. And I hope that you and your family did have a great Thanksgiving day with family and friends. I did not fact check this, so I'm going to say it. Someone else can call me out on it later, but I heard it said, I think it sounds right, here it goes, the average adult eats 4,500 calories on Thanksgiving Day. Do you feel average? Above, Above average. <laughs> There's that thought that if that's the average, that means somebody is above average. There we go. And we certainly do have lots to be thankful for. And, and on Thanksgiving and all days, boy, if we can get in the habit of reflecting God's goodness in our life, that is time well, well spent. And yet, despite all that is good in life and all that we have to be thankful for, sadness is still very much part of our everyday life. It was about four years ago that I read an article that I think puts this into perspective, and I want to read it to you today. It's kind of like a poem, but so-so. You'll see. starts, I am thankful for the wife who says it's hot dogs tonight because she is home with me and not out with someone else. For the husband who is on the sofa being a couch potato because he is home with me and not out at the bars. For the teenager who is complaining about doing the dishes because it means he or she is home, not on the streets. For the, tax, the taxes that I pay because it means I am employed. For the mess to clean up after a party because it means I have been surrounded by friends. For the clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat. For my shadow that watches me work because it means that I am out in the sunshine. For the lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, and gutters that need fixing, because it means I have a home. For all the complaining I hear about the government, because it means we have freedom of speech. For the parking spot I find at the far end of the parking lot, because it means I am capable of walking and I have been blessed with transportation. For my huge air conditioning bills, because it means I am cool and comfortable. For the lady behind me in church who sings off key, don't turn around and look, <laughs> because it means I can hear. For the pile of laundry and ironing, because it means I have clothes to wear. For the weariness and achiness of my muscles at the end of the day, because it means I have been capable of working hard. For the alarm that goes off early in the morning hours, because it means I am alive. Certainly, we have much to be thankful for, don't we? Yes. And yet, as I was reading through this article again this year, I realized that there are undertones of sadness all throughout each statement. The sad reality that wives, some wives are not at home, but out somewhere else that they probably shouldn't be. The sad reality that not all husbands are home, but are in places that could be destroying their life or the lives of their family. The sad reality of teenagers and children of all ages who are out on the street. Sad reality of unemployment and homelessness and poverty and star starvation. All of these things that exist throughout the world. The sad reality of physical imperities. Health issues of all sorts that, put, that cause such pain and discomforts. And the sad reality of death. Not everyone who set their alarm clock last night woke up today. And that'll be true again tonight, and the next night, and the next. 
Sadness is that hard feeling of emotion that is a part of each and every person's life. If you are alive and breathing, you cannot escape. No one is exempt from being affected by sadness. And try as we might, and oh, do we ever try to escape sorrow and sadness. Society wants nothing to do with sadness. We try to drown out sorrows and sadness, not only with the very extremely dangerous substance abuse and alcohol, but we try to, we try to, to drown sorrows and sadness with all kinds of busyness, music, therapists, medication. If it makes me sad, it must be bad. Seems to be the theme of the day, the popular opinion of the day. I mean, if we just took a survey here, how many of you would prefer to have a happy day over a sad day? All those who prefer happy, say happy. happy. I'm going to ask it. And all those who prefer sad, say sad. Sad? I, I like, in my notes, I, I'm going to say, that's like weird. <laughs> but the first service had it as well. It's kind of weird. Of course, if it makes me sad, it must be bad. Of course, that's the right way to think. Unless, unless you think of the Bible and what do you do when the Bible contradicts the maxims that are used by the world. Ooh, take for example... King Solomon, his words in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. You realize that's in the Bible? Since that is the end of all mankind, and the living should take it to heart. It's better to go to a house of sadness than to a house of happiness? Because the destiny of my life and all of mankind ends with death, and the living should take it to heart. When it comes to the Bible, if you are new to the Bible, and even if you've been around the Bible, you've been in the Bible for many, many years, we can expect it to be very, 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 a few more varies, opposite of what society says and does. Society will say, live it up. Party on, eat, drink, be merry. This is as good as it gets. The Bible says, go to funerals. And consider the future and consider the things for your soul. That's about as opposite as it gets in thinking of the way the Bible's way of thinking and the way human beings think. Which is exactly what 1 Corinthians 2.14 says would be the case. The unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's Spirit because it's foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The unbeliever doesn't care about what God has to say in the Bible. The unbeliever doesn't ask for God's Spirit to help. The unbeliever often thinks that the teachings of the Bible are stupid or absurd or boring, a waste of time. And the reason for this is, the verse clearly says, is because this person cannot evaluate spiritual things. As I was studying again this week, I, I tried to think back. Do you remember a time in your life when you thought that way? And what happened? How was it that at one time you were unable, you were uninterested in understanding the things of the Bible, spiritual things, you thought they were boring and dumb, and now here you are like intentionally, on purpose, coming to church to hear the Word of God. You have a hunger for the Word of God. In your daily life, you have a hunger for the Word of God. How does that stuff happen? Well, here's how the Bible describes it. Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens. The spirit now working in disobedience. That's the devil. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, that is the biggest and the best but in the entire universe, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You, my friend, are saved by grace. 
For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God to you. That is going to be the most important thing that you will hear in this sermon. Matter of fact, that's probably the most important thing you can ever hear any day, any place. And so again, I would say, if you are with us as an unbeliever, I am so glad that you are here because you get to hear how others in this room used to be unbelievers, but by God's grace, though we didn't deserve to be saved, God, rich in mercy, with his great love, he saved us through faith in Jesus Christ. And this gift is afforded and offered to you today as well. So I'm glad that you are here with us. And it is from that lens, or those binoculars, if you will, that I want us to look at today on this emotion of, fe- of, this emotion of, of sadness through the gospel. The Bible uses three big repeating words for sadness. It uses the word sad, sorrow, and grief. Psalm 90.10 gives us a summary of life when it comes to sadness. Here's what the verse says. Our lives last 70 years, or if we're strong, 80 years. Each of them, each, even the best of them, are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. You get 70 years, maybe 80 if you're strong. Some do get less than that. Perhaps you're like the Filipino lady who died this last week, who is believed to be the oldest person to be living. Did you know that she died? 124 years old at the time of her death. But regardless of the number of years you get, And though they go by incredibly fast and seemingly faster the older you get, I think that's true. It's a life of struggle. It's a life of pain. It's a life of sorrow and disappointment. And you could be thinking, boy, Doug, this is really glad here today. Well, it is the topic of hard feelings and sadness. And so it is where we are, and I believe God wants us to be there. The reason that sadness is so painful is because all sadness exists, because it's either directly or indirectly the result of sin. Like There was no such thing as grief and disappointment or sorrow until after sin came into the world. Adam and Eve came, and shortly after that, sin came, which means sadness came into existence for human beings. But it's very important that we establish the fact, just like we have done with the other emotions that we've looked at in these last four weeks, of worry and shame and anger, and now the same thing with sadness. In and of itself, these emotions are not sinful. That it's a huge concept for us to get as we continually build up a biblical worldview to live by. That these things are not in and of themselves sinful. This idea of emotions being used both positively and negatively, both being used righteously and unrighteously, it has been highlighted and a point of emphasis all throughout this series. From the Bible, we have shown that worry, worry can be appropriate concern but it can also be a lack of faith to God. Shame can be healthy and productive, but it can also be very, very toxic. Anger, last week, can be righteous or unrighteous. And week four, sadness, can be both godly and ungodly in its format. And that's going to be our jumping off point now for us as we look at this topic of sadness in the Bible. I'm going to give you an outline and then an explanation. Here's the outline. I think of at least three things that Scripture talks about pretty regularly throughout Scripture. And that is that sadness is leading us one place or another. Sadness is best managed by following some strategies of the Bible. Asterisk. Note the asterisk. And then sadness is on the clock. It will not last forever. 
So here's the explanation that I need to give. As I was studying and preparing this week, these three points soon became like messages. That's a message. That's a sermon. That's a sermon. What do you do? We only have one sermon. So I call Mario, who, by the way, is still alive and well. He's on vacation, in case you're wondering. Uh, he's been out of town with his family. I said, Mario, here's what I'm dealing with. What do you think? So we talked about it, and so here's the game plan. I am going to, God's, by God's grace and willingness, to preach sadness is leading us to one place or another. If I have your email, if you're in the Good News email group, then what I hope to do is later this week give you things from the Bible that talk about points two and three. But I wanted to mention them to you because I especially th there is hope for sadness, like it can be managed. I want you to see that and to know that there's stuff there in the Bible that we can be talking about. It's just not going to happen today. And I certainly want us to hear that sadness is on the clock. It's not always going to be this way. Jesus is fixing things, and it will be all the way completely fixed one day. And there's a lot that can be said about that. So the point here is an email will be sent to you. If you want to get this, if you're not on the email, simply fill out a connection card, turn it in, put it in one of the giving boxes in the back, and we'll make sure that the information gets to you. So today it is this. Sadness is on is not on the, sadness is on the clock, but today we're going to talk about just that sadness is leading you to one place or another. Do I have a diagram for that? Yeah, I do, okay? Key verse for us is going to be 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9, 10, 11, but primarily verse 10, and so I want to read this to you as you follow along in your Bible, or it will be up on, on the screen for us. I rejoice, and it's Paul that is talking there, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffer no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Paul is writing a letter to these people that caused them to be sad. And now he is writing another letter to them in response to his previous letter. But for the purposes of our study on sadness, I want us to notice that there is a godly sadness. There is a godly grief that people experience that leads to salvation. And that may seem like a weird concept, kind of like going to a funeral instead of to a party. That this concept here is saying that it is a strange thing to think that sad things lead to a good thing. And yet that's the exact Thing that we have being told here in God's Word. It is a very loving thing, an incredible act of kindness, amazing grace for God to put a kind of sadness into your life and for you to experience sadness in a way that leads you to salvation. And that's the main point that I want to say today, is that the sadness that each and every one of us experience is God's way of showing us love to draw us to Him and not draw us away from Him. And I don't know that the natural man thinks that way. Like that takes a miracle to think that way. But also notice, as we add to the slide and from verse 10, that there's a worldly sadness, there's a worldly grief that is opposite from godly sorrow, and it's also leading, but instead of leading to salvation in spiritual life, it's leading to death. So there is a kind of sadness that leads to salvation, and there's a kind of sadness that leads people to destruction and spiritual death. Sadness is leading every one of us to one place or another. And the most important question then that can be asked is where is the sadness that you are experiencing? Where is it leading you to? And based on the Bible, there's two answers. Your sadness is either leading you to salvation or it is leading you to spiritual death. And how can you know? 
How do I know that the sadness that I'm experiencing, how do I know the path, this path that we live on, this journey that we live on, it's going to be all kinds of sadness going around in our lives of different types. How do I know which path it's leading on? It's a really big deal where it ends. Notice the verse again. I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you, for you felt a godly grief. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. There's the key. Godly grief produces repentance. And godly repentance leads to salvation. But worldly grief does not then lead to a true repentance. It only produces what I would call a worldly repentance. But this kind of repentance leads to death. Spiritual death. So a great question to ask is, so what is godly sorrow? What is godly grief? And what is worldly sorrow and worldly grief? Knowing this is a big deal because it's going to determine how we live these 70 or 80 years or whatever amount of years that we are given. And it's also going to be a big deal because it where, well, how we do this, how we understand this is going to determine where a person spends all of eternity. I think Luke 15 is a great example of what godly sorrow looks like. And it is the Bible story of the prodigal son, if you're familiar with that. So I want us to walk through that and just look and see what godly grief, godly sorrow, godly sadness looks like. Starting in verse 11, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he, had been, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, watch this, verse 18, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. In verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That is an example of godly grief. Godly grief sees the vertical problem of sin. The Bible talks a lot about being able to see the vertical problem of sin. Let me sum it all up in Psalms 51, verses 1 and 2. David speaking, praying, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion, wash away my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. So notice that godly grief see sin as just more than just a disappointing or a sad thing. Godly grief sees sin as offensive to God. Godly grief is not nonchalant when it comes to repentance. It's not a case sirrah sirrah attitude. Oh God, I broke your law again. Sorry God about that. I know you're gracious, so you'll, you'll forgive me. Everything will be good. Well, those things are all true, but it's not in a very nonchalant, casual attitude. And then the next thing we see here from the prodigal son is not only did I sin against the heavens, God above, but I sinned against you. Godly grief has the characteristic of seeing the horizontal problem of sin. Godly grief takes ownership of the sin without passing the blame to others. And oh, how we love to pass the blame to others. Blame the parents, 
Blame children, blame a spouse, blame a boss, a teacher, blame the government, blame the church, blame the circumstances of life. But godly grief won't do that. It sees the problem of sin as self. And when this kind of sadness is upon a person, this person is ripe for repentance. Look again at verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Godly grief produces repentance, which then leads to salvation. Godly grief isn't repentance. It produces repentance. So let's complete that chart because there is a vast difference between repentance and regret. Vast difference. Better said, there is an eternal difference between regret and repentance. Regret feels bad about sin. Repentance turns away from sin. And the difference is literally heaven and hell. And it seems that a lot of people are content with regret. Yes, people feel bad about themselves. We cry for a little while. We realize, ah, I admit how selfish I was. What was I thinking? How stupid I was. How sorry I am about it. But then, is there a change? Repentant people may have a season of a little bit of that, but instead of being obsessed over the regret, feeling sorry for themselves and wondering what the opinion of everybody else is thinking, repentant people turn from sin and find forgiveness for their sin in Jesus Christ. That's exactly what the prodigal son did. So how does worldly grief look? Worldly grief is only sorry for getting caught in sin. You ever know those days? Worldly grief is sorry to have to live with the consequences of sin. Worldly grief is self-centered, but worldly grief does not repent. It doesn't change. And perhaps, perhaps Judas is the best and the saddest example of a person in the Bible having a worldly grief, but not a godly grief. Look at Matthew chapter 27, 3 and 4. It tells us that Judas felt remorse for betraying Christ and that he returned the 30 pieces of silver by which he was bribed and that he even openly confessed, I have sinned by betraying, by betraying innocent blood. But ultimately, we're going to see that this sorrow is not godly sorrow leading to repentance, but it was sorrow only that led, that had a regret to it. Because when the chief priest and the elders wouldn't take the money back, what's verse 5 say? He threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and he departed and he went away and he hanged himself. Judas's, Judas was mourning over the offense that he had committed against the Son of God. His response would have been completely different. Jesus spent three years with Jesus. He knew of the forgiveness he needed. He knew that Jesus had come to die for sinners. But his grief was not the kind of repentance that led to salvation. It was the kind that led only to regret. Worldly grief is the kind of grief that is self-centered and not God-centered. And there is a strong consideration that must be made, especially if you are one who has grown up in the church. Judas's actions are nearly indistinguishable from genuine godly repentance. Look at this. He confessed his sin. He felt remorse for it. He seemingly changed his course. So the strong consideration is this. For any person who professes to be a Christian... For any person who has confessed their sins and have felt sadness for their sin, but does not change in his or her mind, behavior, could very well have the same type of sadness, the same type of grief and sorrow that Judas had. And that is a staggering consideration.
one that has my full attention. It has my full attention as me, human being. It has my full attention for my wife and my children. God's word is so good that it gives us a way to know. It gives us a way to distinguish what type of grief, what kind of sadness, when sadness is upon us, where it is leading us. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 one more time. Because verse 11 is a key component for us. Verse 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance not to be regretted and leading to salvation. Keep going. But worldly grief produces death. Verse 11, For consider how much diligence this very thing, this grieving as God wills, has produced in you. What a desire to clear yourself. What indignation. What fear, what deep longing, what zeal, what justice in every way you showed yourself to be pure in this matter. What is going on here? Well, worldly grief produces death because it is stagnant and idle and the person does not change. This person may regret things in their life, but there is no change. But look at this verse. Godly grief pushes us to take action. What does it mean to clear ourselves from sin? It means believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be indignant, angry, annoyed about sin, bothered about sin in our lives that leads to repentance and salvation? And we do it with this great fearful respect of God, this deep longings full of zeal and passion for Jesus. That's how you know. And if you are living that way, God has given you godly grief that repentance that produces repentance and leads to salvation. And this verse says there is absolutely no regret for having this kind of sadness in your life. Where is your sadness that you're experiencing leading you? Where is it leading me? Because every one of us experience sadness. And God's word would say, the sadness that you experience, I intend to draw you closer to me and not away. Let's pray. Father, it almost sounds weird to say thank you for bringing sadness into our life. For giving this like emotion that we have to deal with circumstances around us. But I thank you because your word says that it, you've given it to us. So we would call it a good gift. Lord, I would ask that based on these verses that the sadness that we experience would be the kind of sadness that produces godly sadness and sorrow. It is good that you've given us this emotion. Father, as we just kind of evaluate through our lives of, okay, what, what is making me sad and what is the response from this sadness? Is our life characteristic by regret and, and trying to, to change the circumstances and, and trying to justify them, and trying to work it out for, for our own good? Father, show us the... the the air of that, the foolishness of that, that it just leads to spiritual death. But instead, Father, let us see the sadness that is a part of our lives in a way that causes us to repent. Let it lead us to salvation. And fill us with the joy that there's no regret in that kind of sadness. And I know it's a heavy topic. There's a lot more that can be said about it that's even better. But I just ask that if there's one person that this would be valuable for, you have your attended 
work for it. I believe it is profitable for all of us. Your word is sharp and living, powerful, cuts through the bone marrow, right to the, pierces the soul. So we ask that it would do what you intended to do, that your will would be done with this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're almost done. One more slide, please. Ah. Ooh. At the start of the series, we said that the preaching series on some of the hard feelings, emotions that we deal with day in and day out, that this series was not going to be clinical, but that it was going to be based on Scripture, and that was, I believe that we have focused on that throughout this series. We haven't got into the science, haven't got into the clinical part of some of these uh, emotions, but just this is what Scripture says. Two weeks ago, Sherry and I had the privilege of getting out of town for a few days and celebrating our wedding anniversary, now 31 years. Yay, yay. Woo. Yep. That is a grace of God, and if you've been married that long, you know that. It's God's grace. Well, we went over to the St. Augustine area, and one of the things that we did was we ate a lot. We ate and we ate and we ate a lot. One afternoon, we took a tour of a chocolate factory. And of course, it came with lots more eating, a lot more samples as we went through the tour. And I highly recommend it. If you go over to St. Augustine, take the tour of the chocolate factory. One of the last parts of the tour, the guide started talking to us about dark chocolate and how it is known to be the happy chocolate because of the properties in it that causes the brain to be happy. But we're not going clinical, so I'm not going to try to explain that. I'm not even sure if it really exists, but maybe it does. But there Sherry and I were talking in the little foyer of after the tour of like, hey, in a couple of weeks we're going to be preaching on this topic of sadness. How about we buy dark, dark chocolate for everybody? So we said, we want you to hear the good news of the Bible about sadness, and it is good. And we want to give you dark chocolate. <laughs> so, it's not under your seat. I saw some of you, like Mario, takes it under your seat. Where, where's that chocolate? It's, it's not there. Um, but, and you being the second service, you are allowed to come back for seconds if there is enough. The first service, I said, you can't be too happy. One piece only. But you guys get to clear out the, out the baskets there in the back. So on your way, please get a piece of dark chocolate. Ecclesiastes 7.2, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, since that is the end of all mankind, and the living should take it to heart. That is good news. You're dismissed. <laughs>